Hallelujah. Christ is risen. The, the Lord, Lord is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Hallelujah. 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 Christ Jesus is Christ vive. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Tata Christ is at our way. Who are Christ Jesus Aleluia, Cristo ressuscitou. Cristo vive. Aleluia. Aleluia, Cristo ressuscitou. Aleluia, Cristo vive. Cristo ressuscitou. Verdadeiramente o Senhor ressuscitou. Aleluia! Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. A very happy Easter to you. It's great that you've joined us for a contemporary service. I'm thrilled that J. John is our preacher today and Ian is leading our intercessions. We're going to be singing. There's some 
all sorts of bits and pieces in the service. Let's sing together. bright with the dawning of hope in Jerusalem Fold in the gray cross to fill the light as the angels announce Christ is risen See God's salvation plan wrought in love born in pain paid in sacrifice Fulfill the man for he lives Christ is risen from the dead see Mary weeping where is he lay as in sorrow she turns from the empty tomb hears a voice speaking call the Lord raised to life again The voice that spans the years Speaking life, stirring hope Bringing peace to us Will sound till He appears For He lives, Christ is risen This is the most important story ever told. Although it's very sad at times, it's also the happiest story. That's because it's true. Jesus was a man who traveled around his country, Israel, 2000 years ago, teaching about God. Jesus knew God because God was his loving father. Jesus did incredible miracles, like healing sick people, calming storms and feeding thousands of people from just five loaves of bread and two fish. That is amazing! Jesus promised people that God's King was coming and that his kingdom was free for everybody to enter. The crowds loved Jesus, but some religious leaders didn't like what he was teaching, especially his claim to be God. At this time, the people were ruled by the Romans, who were often very nasty and forced everybody to pay lots of tax, which is money you have to pay to the government. Unsurprisingly, people didn't like the Romans and looked forward to the day when God's King would rescue them. Many people followed Jesus, including 12 men who were his close friends. They are known as his disciples. One spring, after teaching for three years, 
Jesus and his disciples went to the city of Jerusalem for the feast of Passover. Passover reminded the Jewish people how God cared for them a long time ago and how he had rescued them from slavery. Because it was a feast, there was a special meal to remember the agreement God had made with them when he rescued them. As Jesus and his disciples went to Jerusalem, there was a lot of excitement. It was also a time when people offered sacrifices to God in the temple because they believed that these paid the price for what they had done wrong. Everybody, including Jesus' his disciples, hoped that he was the king they were waiting for. Jesus, however, had warned his disciples that it wasn't going to be like that and that he was going to die and come back to life. The trouble was, they didn't understand him. So, when Jesus came into Jerusalem, he didn't ride in as a mighty king on an impressive horse as the people expected, but instead came on a gentle donkey. People cheered, but they were puzzled. The most important place in Jerusalem was the temple. It was an enormous building where sacrifices to God were made. At its very centre was a special room sealed off by a great curtain. Now, although the people knew that God was everywhere, they believed that this room was somewhere very special. It was as though it was the place where God lived. It was such an important place that only one man was allowed to enter it, and then just once a year. Ordinary people, like you and me, weren't allowed to get anywhere near it. Not at all. The temple should have been treated with respect, but when Jesus went to see it, he found it had become like a marketplace. It was full of noisy animals and people selling things to the poor and cheating them. Jesus shouted, You've let God's house become the home of robbers! And told some people to get out. They didn't like that. Over the next few days, Jesus taught in Jerusalem, but many of the religious leaders wanted to get rid of him. But getting rid of Jesus wasn't easy. He was popular and Jerusalem was crowded with visitors. Then, one of Jesus' disciples, a man called Judas, came to the bad leaders. If you pay me money, he said, I'll show you how to catch Jesus. They agreed to his offer. The sacrifices for Passover were made on the Friday afternoon. The evening before that, Jesus held a special meal with his 12 disciples. He took bread and wine and told everybody that they were symbols of his death. Jesus also told his friends that he would be going away, but he would send them God's Holy Spirit. I'm going to make a new agreement between God and people, he said. His friends didn't understand what he meant. After the meal, Jesus went out with his friends to a quiet garden where he prayed about what was going to happen. As he finished praying, Judas arrived with soldiers to arrest him. Instead of staying with him, Jesus' friends ran away. Judas realised that he had made a terrible mistake, but by then it was too late. Early on the Friday morning, Jesus was brought in front of the religious leaders. They accused him of saying wrong things about God and of claiming to be God's king. Finally, Jesus told them that he was indeed God's king. That made the religious leaders angry and they sent Jesus to the Roman governor Pontius Pilate, a man who had the power to put Jesus to death. Pontius Pilate soon decided that Jesus was innocent and should be set free, but the religious leaders and a crowd that had gathered demanded that Jesus be killed. The Roman punishment for their enemies was crucifixion, being nailed to a cross made from pieces of wood and left to die. Hoping that he could save Jesus from being crucified, Pilate had him beaten by the soldiers. It wasn't enough for the crowd. Crucify him, they shouted. In the end, Pilate ordered that Jesus should be put to death. Now the story gets as sad as any story can be. Jesus was taken away to a place where everybody could see him and he was nailed to a cross. Crowds gathered around the cross and people laughed and joked about Jesus in the cruelest way. Where were Jesus' disciples at this horrible time? Sadly, almost all of them had run away. But some of the women who had followed him 
stayed to watch what happened. As Jesus began to die, an awful darkness fell across the land. Day became night. It was as if Jesus was grabbing hold of every evil and horrible thing in the world and taking it into himself. Finally, Jesus died. As he did, the great curtain in the temple that separated the place where God lived from everybody else was ripped apart by some invisible force. It was a sign that Jesus had made a way to God for everybody. The sacrifices and the temple were never going to be needed again. As the sun began to set, Jesus' body was taken by a good religious leader and wrapped in cloth and taken to a private garden where he was put in a tomb that was like a cave. The tomb was closed by a big heavy stone. Meanwhile, Pontius Pilate ordered soldiers to stand guard around the tomb in case Jesus' body was stolen. Night fell. Saturday was a special day of rest when nothing was allowed to happen. It came and went. The women who followed Jesus knew that because everything had been so rushed, Jesus' body had not been properly prepared for the grave. So early on the Sunday morning, they returned to the tomb with the special spices needed for burial. But when they got there, they found to their astonishment that the soldiers had gone and the big heavy stone guarding the tomb had been rolled away. Looking inside, they saw that the body of Jesus was not there, but instead, neatly folded, was the cloth in which Jesus had been wrapped. It all made no sense. Then they saw an angel who told them that Jesus was no longer dead, but alive. The women ran back quickly to where Jesus' disciples were hiding and told them the news, but they found it very difficult to believe. That Easter Sunday, Jesus began appearing to his disciples and followers. At first, they found it hard to believe, but soon realized there could be no doubt that Jesus was really alive again. It was certainly Jesus because he still had the scars on his hands from being nailed to the cross. And he was really alive because they could talk to him, touch him and eat with him. It was very exciting news because Jesus had fought with death and defeated it. For 40 days, Jesus spoke with his disciples and followers. He turned up in rooms and on roads. He appeared to men and women, and on one occasion to hundreds of people. During this time, Jesus explained to his followers that God's king needed to die in order to be the sacrifice for the wrong things that we have all done. But because he was innocent, death hadn't been able to keep hold of him. Jesus was now the king who could give eternal life to those who trusted him. As Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. Jesus also told his followers that they were to share this good news about him with the whole world and that wherever they went, he would always be with them. He promised that one day he would come back from heaven to earth and make everything in the world new and right. Finally, Jesus met with his followers and told them it was time for him to return to heaven. With those words, he rose into the sky and disappeared from sight. Jesus is God's King and we can know him and know that he will be with us forever. Pray this prayer if you would like to know Jesus. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I ask you to forgive me for all the wrong things I have done and come into my life by your Holy Spirit. Fill me with your peace, your presence and your power. Thank you, King Jesus. Please reign over my life. Amen. I'm 
so glad you're in my life I'm so glad you came to save us You came from heaven to earth you came to save us you came from heaven to earth to show Freddie once sang that he wants to break free. That pretty much captures the mood, you'll agree. No hugs, haircuts or holidays for over a year. The pubs and shops shut. No raucous cheer of fans at the game, of kids at school. Stay home, mask on, two metre rule. But the lockdowns, the measures, they're not without cause. They've been there because death just will not pause. It's assault on us all through this miserable virus. Death is the reason they've had to require us to not see our family or friends for so long. It's death that's the problem, that's what's gone wrong. So here then is the issue you see. When all this is over, when they say, you are free, when we rip off our masks and we hug once again, when we dance and we sing and we gather with friends, I can't wait. But hold on, because despite no restrictions, death hasn't gone. Virus or not, death wins the day, which kind of dampens our hip hip hooray, unless unless there was a way which we could be free from even the grip of death's tyranny. But how, you may ask, can we beat the Grim Reaper? Well, that is the wonderful message of Easter. Jesus, Son of God, came to earth as a man. The Word became flesh. It was always God's plan, and the reason he came was to die for our sin, to swap places with us so that we could begin the life we were made for, free from our shame. At the cross, Jesus took on himself all our blame, the perfect one coming to die in our place so that for all who trust him, they're given God's grace. But the message of Easter doesn't end there. Jesus died, he was buried, but no one could prepare for what happened next. He rose from the dead meaning death no longer has to fill us with dread because on that Easter Sunday, Jesus broke free. He rose from the grave so that if you believe that Jesus died in your place and then rose, then listen to this, here's how it goes. You too no longer have to fear death whenever it is that you take your last breath because Jesus has beaten it. Here's your guarantee. Come to Jesus this Easter, believe and be free. A message for Easter. All of us struggle, but we don't have to struggle on our own. We have a never ending source of support and energy that can work so powerfully within us. All we need to do is depend on God's help and power for each and every task we face. 
That's why I try and start every day the same way. On my knees, quietly, reminding myself that I desperately need the presence of Christ with me. I ask for his forgiveness, uh, his confidence, for his strength. I ask him to protect my family, to guard my words, my, my attitudes and my actions. I ask him to take away my many fears and to give me his peace and to be with all those who are struggling. And God will never let us down. He's always there. Nothing is too impossible for him. There's nothing he can't help us through. No cave too dark or no mountain too steep. He's Lord of it all. As Jesus said, be sure of this, that I am with you, even to the ends of the earth. And this is the way of Christ. He draws us to our knees so he can draw us closer to him. He blesses us so that we can bless others. So let's together this Easter day be his ambassadors on earth. And that's our calling. Love, love, love. This year more than ever, we need a renewed hope. And with this in mind, members of parliament and peers from across the political spectrum have come together to share the Easter story. We hope you enjoy it. At noon, Darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, Surely this man was the son of God. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, and when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of the sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then, then they, they remembered, remembered his, his words. words. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed they saw the Lord. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them and though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. 
Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But, but these, these are written, written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the, Messiah, the Son of God, God and that by, by believing, believing you, you may have, have life, life in his, his name. Happy Easter! Easter to all of you. Why Easter? What a good question and that's what we're going to look at now. Most heroes wear a cape 
my hero wore a cross. Jesus didn't come for an excursion, but he came for an execution. I know I'm not perfect, but Jesus thinks I am to die for. Jesus Christ is my hero. Jesus made some astonishing claims about himself. So, for example, he said, I am the true vine. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth and the life. How do we know those statements are true? There is the famous story of Mallory and Irvin who tried to climb the summit of Everest in 1924. They got very close to the summit but never made it back. Irvin's body was found in 1999. Precisely because they didn't return, no one knows whether they were actually the first people to climb the world's highest mountain. We know Jesus' statements are true because Jesus Christ rose from the dead. The Bible teaches Christ, who was dead, is alive, not a Christ who was alive and is dead. In the Bible, we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning at verse 3, I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the scriptures said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scriptures said. He was seen by Peter and then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles, last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. Why? Would the apostles lie? Liars always lie for selfish reasons. If they lied, what was their motive? What did they get out of it? What they got out of it was misunderstanding, rejection, persecution, torture and martyrdom hardly a list of perks. Jesus' resurrection authenticates everything he said and everything he did. In the 18th century, there was a man called Gilbert West and he was having a conversation with a number of friends discussing Christianity. And Gilbert West said, do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to attack Christianity and I'm going to disprove Christianity and I'm going to write a book disproving that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. He took this very seriously and began researching and began writing his book. But what happened? In the process of writing his book, he met the crucified, risen Jesus Christ and he wrote his book 
the other way around. I've got one of the original copies. Here's his book, written in the 18th century. Proof that Jesus Christ is alive. In the 19th century, a man called Lou Wallace, who was a general in the American army, was asked by a friend of his, who was an atheist, whether he would, because of his high profile, whether he would write a book against Christianity, a write a book to disprove the resurrection. And so he too began to research and began to write his book. But by the time he got to chapter four, he met the crucified, risen Jesus Christ. And then he wrote his book the other way round. His book is called Ben-Hur. You may have seen the film. In the 20th century, a lawyer and a journalist called Frank Morrison, he decided that he would disprove Christianity and the only way you can do that is to disprove the resurrection. He was a lawyer, he was a journalist, he, he knew how to find what he needed for, to argue his case, but, and he knew how to play around with the material. But in the process of writing his book, he met the crucified, risen Jesus Christ. And Frank Morrison wrote his book, The Other Way Round. It's called, Who Moved the Stone? Many people who've endeavoured to explore whether Jesus Christ rose from the dead have discovered that he is alive. If Jesus rose from the dead, then we have to accept all that he said. If he didn't rise from the dead, then why worry about anything he said? The issue on which everything hangs is not whether or not we like his teaching, but whether or not Jesus rose from the dead and therefore he is the truth and his teaching is true. Christianity is not true because it works. It works because it is true. The resurrection of Jesus is the cornerstone to a worldview that provides the perspective to all of life. Jesus' resurrection makes it possible for us, for you, for me, to move towards the light and the love of God. I like what C.S. Lewis, a professor at Oxford who was once an atheist but then encountered the crucified risen Jesus, wrote this, I believe in Christianity as I believe in the sun has risen, not because I see it but because by it, I see everything else. To understand the implication of Easter Day, we need to understand Good Friday. Easter reminds us of the problem of humanity, that we need rescuing. Easter reminds us that for all of our technological triumphs, for all our intellectual successes, we are moral failures and we need rescuing. The Bible records in 1 Timothy chapter 2, there is one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, the man Christ 
Jesus. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. You see, you and I, we are all battling with a virus called COVID-19. But we are all battling with another. It's called sin. And we need to understand what that little word means. It basically means failing to do what God has commanded us to do and doing what has been forbidden for us to do. All of us have done that. You see, before we can see the cross as something done for us, we have to see it as something done by us. St Paul in the Bible says, for God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. All the, the sin that we've done, all the wrong that we've done, it works a bit like an overdraft in a bank account. And if you have an overdraft and I have an overdraft, you can't help me, I can't help you. That's why Jesus Christ came into this world to die on a cross, because by dying on a cross, it was as if he was cashing a cheque, signed with his own blood, to say, here's the cheque, to clear your overdraft so that you could be forgiven. The great artist Rembrandt, a Christian, who had a deep awareness of his own failings, painted a fascinating crucifixion scene called The Raising of the Cross in 1633. It has a typically dark background with the light falling on two central figures. One is Jesus nailed to the cross, the other is a man who is identifiable as Rembrandt himself. It was his way of saying, I did this. I am a participant in Christ's death. And that is true for you and for me. It was because of our sin that disconnected us from God, that Jesus came to die, to forgive and reconcile us. If the cross was just the death of Jesus, it would be the bleakest image in history. It is not Bad Friday, but Good Friday. Christians use the cross as a symbol, not because it commemorates tragedy, but because it commemorates triumph. Jesus died with us and he died for us. The Easter story is of a God who gets involved with us. It's very common to imagine God as remote and distanced, like a satellite in the sky, distantly observing us without concern. But Easter tells us that God gets alongside us. He becomes one of us, even in the worst possible situation. At the horrifying sight of the cross, with 
all its terrible suffering. God is there. A father and his young son were driving down a country road on a beautiful spring day. Suddenly, a bumblebee flew in the car window. Since the little boy was allergic to bee stings, he became petrified. His father quickly reached out, grabbed the bee and squeezed it in his hand and then released it. But as soon as he let it go, his son became frantic once again as it buzzed around the car. The father saw his son's fear once again. He reached out his hand, but this time he pointed to his hand. There, stuck in his hand, was the sting of the bee. You see this, he asked. You don't need to be afraid anymore. I've taken the sting for you. You and I, we do not need to be afraid of death because Christ has taken the sting out of death and sin. One of my favourite stories is the one of the famous artist who went back to the very small rural community where he was born and brought up. And he's just walking around some of the village stores, sees an antique shop, looks in the window, cannot believe what he sees. He sees one of his paintings. It was one that he'd painted years before he was famous. The frame was broken. The picture was dirty. The picture was scratched. It was his. But he couldn't go into the antique shop and say, that's my painting, give it back to me. If he wanted it back, he had to buy it back before he could clean it, restore it and reframe it. That is exactly what God did in Jesus. He bought us back to clean us, to restore us and to reframe us. Jesus came to pay a debt he didn't owe because we owed a debt we couldn't pay. It was love, not nails, that kept Jesus on the cross. Christ's crucifixion as the Son of God allowed our adoption as children of God. Christ went to a place of separation so that we might never need to be separated from God. Christ became empty so that we might become filled. Christ became nothing so that we can become something. That is what the cross is about. Our old history ends with the cross. Our new history begins with the resurrection. We have a great need for Christ and we have a great Christ for our need. The cross is the only door that opens to heaven. The cross is the only passage into God's presence. Why Easter? Without the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, there would be no hope in this world. Christ's resurrection is 
the source of hope. Without Christ, we have a hopeless end. But with Christ, we have an endless hope. Christian hope is a certainty guaranteed by God himself. No matter how devastating our struggles, our disappointments, our troubles are, they are only temporary. No matter what happens to you, no matter the depth of tragedy or pain you face, no matter how death stalks you and your loved ones, Easter promises you and me a future of immeasurable good. Easter gives your life and my life meaning. Easter gives your life and my life direction. Easter gives your life and my life the opportunity to start over no matter what our circumstances. Easter is summed up in this one Bible verse, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God is offering us through Jesus Christ forgiveness from the past, new life here today and a hope for the future. We're all being given an invitation this Easter week by Jesus Christ. Have you accepted your invitation? I accepted my invitation on the 9th of February, 1975, when I was a student in London. My friend Andy showed me in the last book of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, where it says, Jesus stands at the door of a house knocking. And if you hear the knock, open the door and let Jesus in. And I remember my friend Andy said to me, have you heard Jesus knocking on your door? And I said, I think so. He says, have you opened the door? I said, well, I don't know where the door is. He said, don't worry about that. Ask Jesus to break the door down. And so I did. I knelt beside my bed on the 9th of February, 1975. The first time I can ever remember me kneeling or praying. And I prayed. I prayed that Jesus would break the door down. I prayed that I would experience his death and resurrection in my life. I prayed that I would experience forgiveness, new life and a hope. And I did. And I'm more convinced than I've ever been all these years later because I know him. I know the crucified, resurrected Jesus who has set me free. If you want to open the door of your life this Easter time, then wherever you are, wherever you're listening, wherever you're tuned in, whether you're sitting or standing or kneeling, pray these words with me now. Thank you, Jesus for dying on the cross for me. Thank you, Jesus, that you rose from the dead. 
Thank you, Jesus, that you are alive today. I come to you just as I am. I know I have done many things wrong. And I ask you to forgive me. Cleanse my life. Set me free from the past. I invite you now into my life. Come in by your Holy Spirit. Fill me with your peace, your presence and your power. Thank you that I can have forgiveness from the past, that I can have new life today and I can have a hope for the future. Thank you, Jesus Christ, for answering my prayer. Amen. A prayer for you. I pray for everyone that echoed or prayed that prayer. I pray that they would know the truth and the reality of the prayer that was prayed. I pray that you would experience cleansing and forgiveness. I pray that you will be filled with the presence of his Holy Spirit. I pray that you would know well-being in body, mind and spirit, and you would know his protection. And I pray God's blessing upon you, the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, and God the the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you did pray that prayer, wonderful. And it's the beginning of a new day, of a new season in your life. And whether you prayed the prayer for the first time or you prayed it as a way of reaffirming your faith, can I encourage you to read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John in the New Testament of the Bible and, and read the teaching of Jesus and read about the life of Jesus uh, and allow his words to guide you in your next steps. Happy Easter. alone my hope is found he is my light my strength my song this cornerstone this solid ground firm through the fiercest drought and storm what heights of love what depths of peace when fears are still striving seeks my comforter my all in all here in the love of Christ I stand in Christ alone who took on flesh fullness of God in helpless bay this gift of love Righteousness scorned by the ones he came to say till on their cross as Jesus died the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the death of Christ I live.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for this Easter day, the day which saw hope reign instead of despair, the day which saw joy reign instead of sorrow, all because the Lord Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. And we thank you that this is something which doesn't just happen to the disciples of old, as an experience for us. We thank you for the joy of Easter. And we pray, Lord, that as individuals and as a fellowship, we might be the bringers of joy to those that we know and to those that we contact with, that we might bring hope to those who are despairing, that we might show the love of the risen Jesus, whose name we profess, and whom we follow. But Lord, even as we pray, we know that this is a world where there is much sorrow and sadness and despair. Many countries are not places of happiness. We pray for Myanmar at this time, a land where military dictatorship has taken over and people are being killed on a daily basis. And we ask, Lord, for peace in that country. We pray for Mozambique, <coughs> where there is fierce insurrection at this time. And we pray for peace in that country. We pray for Nigeria, where in many places, your people are being persecuted. And we ask that you would help them to stand firm, to stand as lights in the dark place. Lord, we pray for peace, peace in that area. For the Middle East, for so many other places of need, we ask, Lord, for your presence and your joy to be manifest. We pray, Lord, for those seeking to bring aid in desperate places, that you would be with them, encouraging them, helping them, strengthening them. We pray for our own country, for those who have to make decisions which are difficult. And we ask, Lord, that they might be given wisdom and compassion. We pray, Lord, for those who lead your church, both locally, nationally and internationally, that they may be people who help those whom they serve to bring joy. Lord, we thank you that even as we pray, even as we pray for the needs of the world and our country, we thank you that we can pray for individuals. And so we bring before you Anne M, 
Jill H, Gillian D, Gaynor B, David T, and Carol, and John F and Kevin K, Judy B, David G, Colin E, Emily E's mum, Celia B's mum, Dave A, Joanne B's dad, Karen W, Richard J, Georgina, and Terry and Tina, Reg and Sally C, Roy O and Peter K. Lord, you know their needs. You know them better than we do. For many of us, these are only names. But to you, they are people who are special, people who are loved. And we pray that on this Easter day, they may know the special presence of the Lord in their situation. So, Lord, we thank you that we can bring all our prayers to you in the name of our risen Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And so we do. In his name we pray. Amen. Gathering our prayers and praises into one, as our Saviour has taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and for ever. Amen.
let's join together in the words of the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.